Joining us, we have Marcus Board with us. Thank you so much, Marcus, for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Take it away. This The floor is yours. What do you have for us? Uh, this is a new segment called No Capital. Very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, several parents and adults took it upon themselves to protest a pride assembly at Satakoy Elementary School in Los Angeles. The protest would end in a fight after police officers had to separate those protesting the assembly and those in support. So comedian D.L. Hughley reacted to the news on Instagram saying, quote, just FYI, some of those folks showing up on both sides don't even have kids in the school. I remember being in the fifth grade when they would separate the boys and the girls and talk about reproduction. Parents can fight all they want, but the kids are gonna learn what they learn from a phone or the street and not really in the classroom, close quote. There was shouting, shoving, and one person was even knocked to the ground outside Satakoy Elementary School in North Hollywood. I disagree with the fact that a kindergarten should not have to be educated on this. There comes a time and a place where they all do need that education, but kindergarten and elementary is not the place. In public schools, there's going to be uh, students who have uh, same-sex parents, so we need to talk about that. The Great Big Book of Families, which discusses LGBTQ families was read. The book starts off with once upon a time there was a nuclear family that consisted of a mommy, a daddy, a sister, and a brother. And then it goes on to talk about the different families and it mentions that families can have two daddies and two mommies. So the problem that we see is that it starts off as a fairy tale. And what is a fairy tale? It's make-believe. It doesn't exist, right? So you're telling our children at the beginning of the assembly the nuclear family, the traditional family that my children know is make-believe and that the reality is the two mommies and the two daddies. We went to the educators and we said, what are, what are you going to tell my child when he comes to you and says, what does it mean to have two daddies? My mommy was pregnant with me. Which daddy was pregnant? How did the daddy have a baby? The only thing I would add is that the conversation around kids and protecting our children, we always focus on the content that they're being told, but we rarely focus on the people that they're being exposed to. And I think in a lot of ways, we need to protect those kids from those people who came to a school to protest when the reality is, why are you protesting with the kids? They don't actually have any say in this. They're just going to school. And so I think one of the things we have to really figure out is how to push back against people who have strong opinions, who have the right to advocate for their own children, but who are also doing it in a way that adds to the threat that queer kids feel, that adds to the threat that Black kids feel, that adds to the problem and distracts, as Capone said, from the bigger issues that we're having in these schools, which is that they're trying to take away more from these children as opposed to adding to them and their futures. Now, Marcus, before you go, let me ask you, are you surprised, though? You know, are, are you surprised where we are with things, you know, seeing what we're seeing online, seeing this protest? Does it surprise you any? No, it's not surprising. I mean, I study public opinion, so it's something that I'm pretty well attuned to the boundaries and limitations that Americans are, are um, facing. But I think one of the things that I really want to encourage and, and something that I advocate for very often is figuring out ways that we can bring people together in conversation. That doesn't mean that people are always going to agree or that people are going to see eye to eye, but figuring out who is actually willing and interested in having a conversation because that's the line for me. Some people don't want to talk. Then people out there fighting, they don't want to talk. They just want, they want smoke. And, you know, we have that too. But the reality is we need to figure out who's on our side enough to be able to push the conversation forward to say, hey, even if we disagree, we all agree that we want to support our kids and bring them into a world that's better than the one that we got. My curiosity is what should the conversation be? About? What should we sit at the table and have a conversation about? The LGBT community, we know they exist. We respect them. Um, but now it's a whole different thing where it's not even the LGB community. It's it's the uh, the ones that dress the drag queens that's coming into the schools and having sessions with children. Like what what kind of conversation should we sit back and say, well, you know, just let them let them come and perform for y'all. We don't have these conversations when it comes down to being black. These conversations are not in an uproar with anything. Police are still killing us. They're doing all kinds of things to us. We don't have equal rights or whatever. Whatever decision that is made in our lives has to come from a white institution. When do we get a say-so in something in our lives that is more important than our kids seeing a bunch of men dressed in women clothing? 
That's that's what I want to understand. You raised some great points. And I think this is a big part of why I was talking about Black queer history. So Pride started with Black, queer, and trans people, right? Marsha P. Johnson, very famously, was at the center of that riot and protest. And so one of the things that I really want us to talk about is how queer history is Black history, right? And, and if we can understand the connections between police violence and gender-based violence and sexuality-based violence, right? How Black trans people are killed at a disproportionate rate, how Black trans people uh, are impoverished and their lives are more challenging at a disproportionate rate. And if we say that all Black lives matter, then we will be focusing on our queer and our trans brothers and sisters. It's a part of having that conversation to say that, yes, you can absolutely whitewash queer history and the queer experience, but you can also go back and say, hey, there are Black people who are at the center of this movement who are pushing these conversations in such a way that allows us to push forward as a people, right? When the least of us are free, all of us will be free. And that's kind of the drive that I think we can have a conversation around. Yeah, I, I like what Mark said. Uh, I agree with a lot of it. Um, but here's the thing. Um, at, when you have children, your number one job is to protect your children. And I, however way you feel that, that protection is. And if you don't want certain information to come into your children's head, you have the right to protest that and say, I don't want my children to hear this now. I have as a parent. Now, maybe my child will go on later on and hear more about the LBGT, the queer, you know, whole group of people, and they will teach their children. But this time right now, it's my job to protect my child. Damn what you want my child to know and hear and say, well, I want your child to hear about everything. I understand that. But it is a right of a parent to say, I want to protect my child from certain things the way I grew up was this. You may think, well, now it's a change in the guard. You need to change. Well, that's you saying that. But right now, I want to protect this child or these children, and I don't want that to come into their minds. Or I will explain to them at home. Um, but then I get the case of CRT. You know, people don't want that in school either, to be taught, you know, racial or uh, uh, critical race theory also. But people are fighting for that. I, I understand that. So we all want to have our, our, our foot in, uh, 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 you know, in the pot, and, you, know, it's, you know, to say. Uh, Marcus, let me let me ask you this, because I think bringing in CRT, obviously, that that's a big issue right now as well. Do you think, you know, when we're talking about CRT or even having these conversations about the LGBTQ plus community in school, do you think some of these parents have a base like uh, the base of what they're feeling is fear? Do you think some of this is is based in fear of why they don't want their kids to be taught or it to be included into their their schooling for their kids? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think fear has been the main driving force behind American politics for at least the last 23 years since the Bush administration, uh, if not the last 30 or 40 years since Reagan. Uh, one of the big challenges there is that a lot of the normal family structure, normal ideas of sexuality, even just the idea of normal itself is based around being afraid. One of the big questions here, and we can't necessarily think about this issue outside of the broader context of all of the hundreds of laws around the country that are taking women's rights uh, to conceive or to not have kids, that are taking Black history out of schools, that are telling kids that there is a right way to love somebody or someone else or the right way to have parents or not. Right. One of the bigger issues that this problem, this fear actually reproduces is it creates new closets for people to have to hide in. Right. The closet doesn't exist because gay people exist. The closet exists because homophobic people exist. Right. The closet exists because racist people exist and because we have to hide in public. The closet exists because somebody got pregnant and can't tell somebody about it and can't get the type of care and treatment that they need. These are the reasons why the closets exist. So when these people come out and they say, well, we just fighting for the rights of our kids, they are using that as an excuse because they do have that power as parents, but they're using that as an excuse to actually push a political agenda that disempowers black people, that disempowers poor people, that disempowers women and queer people. It pushes all of us to the outside. And the only way that I know of to actually push past that is through a comprehensive conversation educating ourselves and our allies and our advocates and our accomplices to be able to fight back and empower ourselves to change the direction. Let me, and let me ask you this, Marcus, and, and this will be my last question. I know I've told you a couple of times 
this is going to be my last question. And, 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 and I don't, I'm not speaking about anybody here, but just from some of the conversations that I hear, right? Do you think some of that fear is also that if their child is exposed to these things, that their child may become a part of the LGBTQ plus community? Do you think some of that is, is some of the fear as well? If we're, you know, if we're just being straight honest, no capital, no cap, no cap. <laughs> right, right. Of course. I mean, one of the, the things that happens a lot, and I know I was taught this, is that Black people are more homophobic than any other people. And that's just not true. Right. One of the things that we get taught is that Black people are more biased than other people. Black people are this and that and the third. Right. We get told that we're all these different things. And the reality is all communities contain multitudes. Right. We do have Black people who are extremely violent and homophobic in the same way that we have Black people who are extremely liberatory and revolutionary. And so people's fear for their children can manifest in any number of ways, but it doesn't have to manifest in violence. That's for me. I root that into white supremacy, which is why I think critical race theory still does need to be taught, not just at the college and university level, but even down lower to, to kids and to families. In a lot of ways, what's happening here is that we're teaching children to be more open, to be more inclusive, and they're bringing it back to their parents and the parents don't want to be taught by the kids. That's the fear I actually think mm -hmm. most people face is that they don't want to be subordinated. They don't want to be taken down by their kids and taught by their kids because they think if I don't keep on top of them, then I lose whatever power or strength that I think I have in this world. And that's a challenging place to be, right? right? That's really hard to have a child trying to direct you and lead you into the future. But the reality is every single person that exists will face that. So, yes. you know, you can either get with the future or you can fight it, right? But the reality is if you want to be in community, and this goes back to what Capone was saying about what the conversation is, the conversation is sometimes less about what we're talking about and more about who's willing to be in the room with you. And I think that's what's really important. That tells you who cares, who's committed, and who actually values you and your life. And I think that at the center of it, to what Pierre was saying, has to be what the conversation is about. How do we care about each other better? Pierre, let me bring you in. What are your thoughts as we close out? Um, I, again, I agree with him again on most of the stuff, um, but the critical race theory, like I wouldn't teach that to elementary school kids. I, it's not necessary at that point. You could teach, you know, you could show black kids playing with white kids and Asians, that, like, as I grew up seeing that in, in pictures. But to get down to the critical race theory, I don't think, you know, in elementary school is necessary there. It's not, they're not really going to get into feeling that too much until after they get older. So why put that heavy burden on young kids who are just trying to have fun? We, we are trying to be adults and put it on the young kids. We're grown ass people trying to act like our problem got to be to the little kids problem. Let kids be kids until they get out of the kid zone. And then if you're so worried about it, then teach it at home. You know what I'm saying? If you're so worried about it, if not, wait till they get older when they, you know, when they get in junior high school where they're going to start probably getting around and more of that kind of stuff and teach them then, or have taught them at home a little bit about it. But to force kids to get into heavy subjects at a, such a young age is unfair. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about why we bombing um, certain countries, Russia, and we're doing deals with that in elementary school. Why would we? We ain't showing how many, how many people we kill in other countries and take over. We did Saddam Hussein, all that kind of stuff. We don't show that to children and say, listen, this is what we're doing as Americans. We're doing all this stuff because it's not time for them to, to know that. They're kids. Let them rock and roll as being kids and show them good things on, you know, at the growing up. They're, they're only going to have a childhood, but one time, shit, why ruin this shit by putting so much pressure on them as a young kid? Maybe, maybe walk by the time they get out, out of sixth grade, they'd be tired as hell and they'd be hating people and marching and shit and not knowing this and that. Come on. You know, just because you teach don't mean it's going to be accepted correctly. So let kids be kids until a certain age and then bring them all the bullshit that we adults have in our mind. Not marching, Pierre. Now, not me going to see a whole kid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs>